Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC the opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Lisa Greenhill, and I'm the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. So on today's episode, I am delighted to uh, welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Brandt from the American Veterinary Medical Association. She is the Director of Wellbeing and Diversity Initiatives. Welcome. Thank you so much. Great to be here. So uh, this is a kind of newly repackaged, formatted program. <clears throat> Previously, um, um, in its previous iter uh, iteration, I guess, it was held by Dr. Um, Beth Sabin, another great friend and colleague of the show. Um, but uh, AVMA made, kind of made some changes, uh, organizational changes, and decided to hire someone full time to focus exclusively on wellness and diversity. And so... Uh, so Dr. Brandt, Jen, uh, stepped into that role how long ago now? I started August 21st of last year. All right. So you are still within the one-year newbie window. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So Jen, why don't you tell, uh, tell us about yourself? So uh, Dr. Jen Brandt, and uh, I'm a social worker. My bachelor's, master's, PhD are in social work and generally a focus on health, well-being and diversity and inclusion over the years. Uh, so I started off in uh, human health care and worked a lot with uh, court systems, police systems, working with survivors of crime and trauma and those who had terminal illnesses. Uh, I guess not a very happy topic, but that's what I focused on. And also had an interesting uh, foray into early childhood education, which provi provided a, a great foundation in terms of how our brains develop and, um, you know, how we develop the views that we do. And uh, that turned into an opportunity working with the College of Veterinary Medicine at Ohio State, where I was for 20 years uh, before joining the AVMA. Oh, great. Uh, that's a broad set of uh, experiences that I know the profession will certainly benefit from. <laughs> it gives us all a lot to talk about. So why don't we dive in? So what's going on with diversity and inclusion at AVMA? I think when I, uh, I think of a couple words that come to mind, uh, like a lot of listening, a lot of learning and a tremendous amount of collaboration. Um, really recognizing that we want to be supportive of efforts and, and also know that partly how we can do that is uh, tapping into the talents and the expertise of the folks who have been doing this work for years. So um, a lot of collaboration with organizations such as AAVMC, LGVMA, Voice, Broad Spectrum, SAVMA, our state and allied organizations. Uh, it feels like there's so many to list. Native American Veterinary Association, Multicultural Veterinary Medical Association, um, and diving deeper into partnerships, you know, so how can we how, how can we take these collaborations and really translate them into applied opportunities for learning and education and research? Great. So how do you see? So there's a, a lot of uh, listening and learning, um, you know, certainly over the years, AVMA has has really move the ball on this quite a bit. I remember back in the mid 2000s, which seems like an eternity ago at this point. Um, but, you know, we had the diversity task force and certainly, um, you know, that that launched a number of changes within the organization and, and really allowed the group to, to think more critically around these issues. And certainly over the last probably five or six years, we've seen um, an increase in movement again. So in terms of your job, uh, how do you see this space, this DNI space, really a part of your portfolio? Because you also have wellness, which we know is a huge issue. And we can talk about that as well in the profession. But how do you see the DNI part um, growing? Um, it's it's interesting because I, I actually see the DNI part that is the portfolio. Um, for me, my perspective on it is that well-being, diversity, and inclusion are just kind of, uh, they're inextricably linked. You cannot have one without the other. So, um, you know, in the social work world, we talk a lot about belonging versus fitting in. 
and how essential that is to absolutely be our best selves, to thrive, uh, to be able to express yourself creatively. And you cannot do that in an environment where you are not welcomed or you don't feel safe. And so for me, diversity and inclusion is the portfolio. Um, I also think, you know, for all of us, even for people who've worked in this space for a long time and bring a lot of expertise, there's, as you know, there's no ceiling to these right. skills. There's no ceiling to, oh, well, I did diversity, so I can have the box and move on. Um, just like there's no ceiling in communication skills and how we talk about it. And so I think recognizing that, always being willing to say, here's what we know today what we know today may be different tomorrow. And so I think constantly challenging ourselves to evolve and, and grow with the times. Um, I also, I, I see it the work also happening in, in different segments, I guess, for lack of a better word. So some of it is internal. Like how do we all as an organization work collectively together to really integrate con concepts, you know, to make sure that our research arm and our marketing and communication arm, that we're all really working collectively to model the change that we want, in addition to helping outside the organization and the profession as a whole grow in these areas. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's <clears throat> really important. And, and when you started your position, um, you and I had some really great conversations about kind of what does a, an organization that believes in diversity and inclusion do, right? And so, um, and and there are lots of things that that these types of groups do. Um, so it is reflected in the way that we collect data. It's reflected in the way that um, we uh, put out media. It's product. Pro um, it is um, shown in the way in the language that we use. Is it in our mission and vision statements? Um, do we, um, are we thoughtful about the types of images that we put out? And that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have to have a, um, a, a it's a small world in every picture. <laughs> That's not the goal. <laughs> but in the same way that I think um, there's probably some sensitivity for all of our veterinary organizations in terms of, um, do we have too many cats and dogs in an image? Um, how do we portray other, um, not only species types, but how do we also talk about um, the breadth and scope of the the profession in terms of non clinical careers? It's the same. I mean, th it's the same issue, just a different cast of characters, right? Yeah. So I think that that helping um, us organizationally, these are kinds of cons conversations that we have at AAVMC as well to kind of think about um, internally. How do we do the work that we do? Um, in a manner that it reflects diversity and inclusion values, that those are core values here. Um, and then that n naturally um, flows into the programming that we create and put out. Absolutely. Right. right. So you were uh, at oh, the Ohio State, the Ohio State University uh, yeah. for a number of years. And I have to say that um, in thinking about diversity and inclusion and, and representation, uh, I have to give a shout out to the Ohio State University. Like that institution has been slightly overrepresented on my podcast this season. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I think that's great because I believe that the university is doing incredible work. <laughs> so uh, I will say that it, um, everyone who's been on the show has been fantastic. Um, there's some amazing talent there. And um, I'm very appreciative of all of the referrals um, for <laughs> good contacts that you've made. But now in season four of this podcast, I'm going to have to... <laughs> <laughs> spread, the, the spread, of <laughs> spread the wealth. Fair so enough. why don't you tell us a little bit about the work that you did at um, Ohio State and how social work is, um, I mean, you, you alluded to it already um, with this background, but um, how is social work, your social work background being really leveraged in your now newish, almost a year position? Right. Um, I probably like a lot of people, their education. I don't know that I could separate myself now from social work education. I mean, I've been um, immersed in that since, I don't know, the early 80s. I'll probably date myself there. Um, it's the scaffolding from, you know, how I operate. It's how I think. It's how I 
question the world. It's my curiosity. Um, the core values in social work are service. And so I'll often uh, talk with folks about how can we be of best service? Uh, it's social justice. Uh, social justice isn't just an idealized vision. It's an ethical mandate in the profession. And so a great deal of time and education goes into what does that mean and how does that manifest? And um, dignity and worth of individuals is essential to social work education. Relationships, that we cannot operate in a vacuum, that we are our best selves in relationship to other people. And integrity and competence are core values in social work. So every everything I do is based on that. Um, and I think of how grateful I am for that education and that foundation. Um, also from the social work world, there's a, a huge part of your training and your ongoing um, work in the field is peer mentoring, uh, peer supervision. So it, it's expected and normal, for lack of a better word, that you, you would reach out to your colleagues. And so it's a very collegial, collaborative, people wanting you to be successful and thrive in what you do. And so that really informs everything that I do. Yeah. And I think that for, for folks that are still, that are um, excited to kind of see some of the new diversity language in the veterinary education uh, accreditation standards, um, you know, for, for veterinary medicine, that's still pretty new. Right. But for social work that it, it's nothing new, <laughs> it was kind of it was always almost always in the um, accreditation standards around education for um, uh, social work. And so this is something that is really embedded. And I think that as as the profession as veterinary medicine continues to evolve as a profession, kind of thinking about what that will look like long term. <clears throat> with these other kind of professional models like uh, social work, I think will be really helpful for us to see, you know, what this might look like 20 student generations out. Absolutely. Right. So, uh, so what are you doing out there? So what are your programmatic plans? Um, I know that as we record this show um, later this week, there will be a, uh, you know, on mass. <laughs> <laughs> um, gathering of folks to talk about wellness, yeah. um, veterinary medicine and social work and, and veterinary social work, which is a new emergent field by itself. So uh, what else you got going on? So again, really linking the well-being, um, diversity and inclusion pieces all together. A lot of it is um, active outreach. Uh, I, I I think if you really want to make substantive, meaningful change, part of that is the the relationships that you develop. Um, you know, it takes trust to take a leap of faith and uh, and try out new things, maybe in a practice or organization, or try out new language. So a lot of what we do is really dedicated to outreach and engagement. Um, participating in the first uh, annual voice retreat that occurred. Uh, the North Carolina diversity program, um, making sure that we're a participant in that. And then there's just a whole host of alphabet soup. You'll know them. So Abercams, the biomedical research conference, SACNIS, um, advancement for Chicanos and uh, Hispanics, manners, minorities and agricultural. It's a lot of alphabet soup, but <laughs> making sure that again, we're, um, that we're supportive of those efforts, that we have a presence, that we're teaching and involved and also actively asking questions about how can we best amplify the existing efforts that are out there. Really working closely with um, state and allied organizations. And so like uh, American Association of Bovine Practitioners, Equine Practitioners, making sure that the lens we're looking through isn't simply a small animal lens. Um, Leadership training, uh, what's it look like to be a culturally competent leader in today's society, public speaking training, uh, supporting um, more research. So looking at issues like the gender gap um, and equity in the workplace, developing online modules and resources so that people have easier access to, to information if they're not able to attend. Uh, a summit, and and then you mentioned the well-being summit, which has been um, a big part of my um, last few months and getting ready for that. Sure, sure. So, uh, so what are the current diversity stats? What are the current stats related to veterinary medicine? Um, 
So this is a big question. <laughs> It is, and and I it, I struggle with this one because we uh, the data that we have where we really rely on member data, and so in in looking at the the data that we have available, at least in terms of race ethnicity, we only have information on maybe about twenty five percent of our members. So one for those of you who are listening, if you are AVMA members, we would urge you to please go into your demographic profile. Um, in the membership profile section and update it or make sure that you've answered the questions because we really rely on that. Um, uh, really briefly, what we know from the membership data that we have available is that right now the majority of people in the profession, at least as members, are women. I think about 60% um, Caucasian and prominently or predominantly working in small animal practice. Yeah. Which you know, I, I guess from a research perspective, 25% uh, is a <laughs> pretty good response rate. Um, we would certainly like more. Um, I this is this has been a challenge for me as a as a researcher in, in diversity and veterinary medicine. So oftentimes I'm I'm kind of forced to use the data from the EEO surveys um, at the U.S. Census Bureau uh, because they do collect that information. And for them, uh, yeah, it's about 60%. The data that they report is about 60% women uh, and about 7% um, non-white. Okay. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen that data certainly change over the years. Um, when I first started, um, the EEO data said that we were about 3% <laughs> non-white. Oh. So, so there's been a 4% increase over uh, nearly 20 years. So we'll it take it. <laughs> it to know the actual number. Um, again, with just our 25% data that we have on race, race ethnicity, we have um, non-white category at about 14%. Oh, wow. Um, and I, my heart was like, if that's the case, I, it's like we would be really making headway and some progress. So I would be curious um, as we can get more data points, you know, if we can get that number 50% um, or 75% completion rate on those questions, it would be interesting to see what the, what the story is. So you heard it, podcast listeners, uh, if you are a member of the AVMA, if you are soon to be a graduate of <laughs> um, a school or college of veterinary medicine and you're going to be a member of the AVMA, please sh be sure to fill out that demographic information. Um, go in, clickety-click, do whatever it is that you need to do to log on. There is our joint plea. <laughs> <laughs> and now we'll return to our regularly scheduled programming. Don't worry, I'll remind you again at the end of the show. So, so what are some of the biggest challenges? Certainly it appears that data collection might be one. Um, but what are some of the biggest challenges um, that you've seen or experienced over this last year or so in, in the way of working in the DNI space? Um, I I would say the challenges we have are not unique to our organization. I imagine um, they are shared by many. And I think part of it is communication um, on, on two levels. You know, one, communicating about the business case and the moral ethical case for diversity and inclusion. But I also think that creates communication challenges. Um, you know, for example, when I think in the, in the school systems where or the colleges where we're doing a much better job recruiting uh, diverse applicants. I don't know that we necessarily have the infrastructure that supports the success of diverse individuals. What I'll often hear is if you're an N of one or an N of two in an organization, what happens is you kind of just get quiet. You're trying to blend. You don't want to be the one. And so then we actually lose the benefit of diversity and inclusion. And so, and, and I think that's, a really important piece that we need to look at. Again, not unique to veterinary medicine or our organization. And then I, other, I think the other reality is that there is resistance to change, period. From some just, this isn't the way it's been done before, I'm uncomfortable to, I downright disagree with this philosophy. And so, um, you know, there's a real need to be flexible and evolve. And, and, and I think that that's hard for us as a species. We struggle with that because we like constancy and, and knowing what's coming next. And 
this is a space that really keeps evolving. What, like I said, what we know today may be different tomorrow. And so the flexibility that that requires, um, I, I think those will be ongoing challenges. I would also say, um, and I would take this back to my, my social work education, that one of the things that you learn for meaningful change, it's going to be uncomfortable. So it, if we think we're going to have these conversations and make any head rows and nobody's going to be uncomfortable and nobody's feelings are going to be heard and that we'll never have to have a difficult conversation, then our expectations are are going to need to be adjusted. Like this is uncomfortable. It, right. It's hard to talk about privilege. It's hard to talk about things that impact people. And yet those conversations are really necessary. And and I think those conversations do occur better one on one in small groups. You know, it's hard to communicate all those nuances in a in a in a webinar or teaching a classroom of 500 people. So I think those those are our biggest challenges and will likely continue to be challenges. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the nature of change and anyone who doesn't think that change is at least modestly painful on a good day. Right. right. <laughs> Doesn't know change. Right? Does not know change. Yep. So, so what do you see are some of the biggest opportunities? Uh, I, I just think we, you know, we live in an evolving time. Social media. We just have uh, so many other resources at our disposable now, and more information at our disposable at, at our disposal. I think part of it for me is I just see such an earnest, intentional commitment and a. Um, a real passion to to be better and to do better and to raise the bar um, in our standards and and how we interact with people and so I think the opportunities are really that just that mindset and that that true dedication to um, collaboration and uh, bringing out the best in each other and so for me it's been a really inspiring time to join um, an organization that seems so dedicated and willing to roll up their sleeves and work hard. Um, to make the world a better place. That's awesome. So now we're going to get into the super hard questions. <laughs> well, I thought As... we were. <laughs> beer. Do I be nervous? All right. <laughs> no, of course not. So, you know, I wanted to take an opportunity for, for I mean, we both are, are working at um, veterinary associations um, that, that, play a pretty big role in kind of um, uh, certainly AAVMC, we're all about academic veterinary, medical, uh, academic veterinary medicine, veterinary medical education, and kind of thinking about um, what's coming, wh what's on the horizon in terms of what do um, students and prospective students need to know, all right, about what it means to practice veterinary medicine. And, um, and then at the professional association, how to do it, right? <laughs> how right. So one of the things that I wanted um, us to, to briefly at least um, touch on during this show was the Me Too movement. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, over the last 50 years, the profession has seen a dramatic um, change in its gender composition, um, starting in the late um, or early 1970s, um, really seeing the biggest, it was some of the, the big initial jump right after um, the adoption of Title IX, um, which I think that that across higher ed you see a lot of difference there. Um, but more recently, these issues around the Me Too movement, um, which kind of popped, I guess, around the time that you were joining AVMA, yeah. um, it's had a big impact on discussions um, around sexual harassment in general, but but really specifically in varied workplaces, and so. I'm kind of curious about what your thoughts are, given how gendered um, some of the conversations in veterinary medicine can be. Um, how do you see, uh, where do you see AVMA um, taking opportunities to um, look at issues around harassment and gendered harassment? Um, where do you see, what, where do you see opportunities and, and what can the professional association do to kind of weigh in on, on this? Uh, great question. Um, yeah, talk about a sea change. Right. Uh, I would say if you speak to many women, they'd say that this was not new information for us, but having our stories be believed and validated or, or really anybody who has survived uh, harassment, sexual harassment in the workplace to, to say my story is now believed um, is a huge movement. 
uh, one of the steps that we took, an initial step, was we did address that topic in one of our uh, blogs, I believe a, a, an AVMA at Work blog, where we just talked about the issue pretty frankly. That was in uh, February of this year and uh, listed some resources of places that people can go. So I, I think it needs to stay part of the conversation. We get more and more um, proposals for presentations at convention or other events where people want to address this topic head on and not only talk about the prevalency of it, because I think that's important, that it's important to recognize that women, uh, people of color and those with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by harassment in the workplace. Um, so honest conversations about that, but also where can we go from here? And so some of the steps are, are basic and yet in some ways that's good because they're, uh, they can be applied. So I hear a lot of feedback over the years from people who say, I still get asked illegal interview questions, you know, that I, I, if I'm a woman, I can go in and I'll be asked when I'm going to have children or is childcare going to impact my ability to perform my job? And a male who has children at home will go in for the interview and not be asked that question. So some of it can be pretty basic and simple. Like, here are questions that are uh, legal to ask. Here are questions that are not legal to ask. Um, also informing people about what appropriate workplace behavior looks like and where you can go if that's not happening in your workplace and places that you can go where you feel safe um, talking about these issues. So again, these are these can be difficult, uncomfortable conversations. Um, many people will say, well, hey, that sounds like something I did in the workplace, but I didn't mean anything by it. So also having frank discussions about intention and impact that maybe your intention didn't wasn't to cause harm. And yet uh, making comments like that or being physically intimidating or asking illegal interview questions actually do have an impact on people. So I think we can join that conversation, be a part of it. Um, and amplify the other voices who are part of that conversation already. You went, I can't hear you. You muted. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, the the bl at work blog post that you referenced um, is called Finding a Solution to Workplace Harassment. Um, and I will uh, we'll be sure to drop that, uh, drop a link to that both on our Facebook page as well as in the show notes um, mm -hmm. so that folks have um, um, access to that if they haven't, if they didn't see it in February. And, and I really appreciate that there are just a few really key messages in that blog and, and um, you know, they are commit to a culture of respect, implement policies and procedures because when you don't have them, that's a problem. Lead by example and revamp your training, which can also be if you don't have training, get some. So, right. <laughs> and then finally, enforce accountability. Um, and I think that the the accountability piece is it's just it's just crucial. And even you know sometimes we. Um, I, I, I do a lot of research in a lot of different areas, and sometimes knowing better is not necessarily correlated with doing better. Yeah. <laughs> so really making sure that the the expectation that that is is there for both knowing and doing better is really important. So we'll be sure to 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 take a link um, to link with that resource. Okay. So, um, so what do you say, think are any other ways that AVMA can promote increased diversity in the profession? Certainly, um, I know that uh, you and your colleagues are out uh, with shoe leather out with me or <laughs> to, at Manners and Sackness and Abcram. Certainly, we're all um, doing some recruiting, specialized targeted recruiting. But what are some other things that I think not just AVMA, but all of us can do to promote um, diversity and inclusion in the profession? I'm, um, at least all the research we know is that people identify or, or choose to go into veterinary medicine at a pretty early age. And so for me, and it takes me back to my early childhood education years, to really influence the pipeline of people who are interested in the profession, we have to start really early. Um, and folks are already doing that. Um, one of the programs that I'd really highlight, and I did not ask her permission, but I, I hope it's okay to talk about it because I just, I, I think it's a stellar program, um, is the one out of Purdue, This Is How We Roll. Yeah. And um, 
so making science and math fun. And what I also love is that they're not just talking about the science and the math. They're actually also talking about how to be healthy and well, you know, like good nutrition as a kid. Mm -hmm. And then how do you blend the interest in science and your own health um, and have an impact on the health of the planet, whether that's through humans or animals. And so I would say, and if anybody hasn't checked it out, check out the This Is How We Roll program, um, R-O-L-E program through Purdue. Um, I, I believe that that really is an answer. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as part of their uh, work, they have books out and I won't get all the titles right, but I think like donkeys need dentists too yeah. and elephants need eyeball care. Um, so just, you know, in, in beautiful imagery and stories, um, bringing to life the, the incredible capacity that veterinarians have to make a difference in the world and just getting to folks soon, I guess, is the ultimate message. Yeah, that program is amazing. And, uh, actually as we record this, uh, there is uh, a grant submission that's open now to, um, at Purdue uh, for um, participation in the This Is How We Roll program. I think that the applications are due April 15th. Um, so uh, if anyone gets a hold of this before then, be sure to get it in. Um, but yeah, there's great books. The imagery is just amazing. They're beautiful, beautifully illustrated. Um, they are available in uh, English and in Spanish. And oftentimes in the same book, you just flip it over, <laughs> which is pretty ingenious. So Dr. Sandra San Miguel at Purdue uh, heads up that program. And uh, it's, it's really something that I think we all are very, very proud of and, and really excited to see some of the data that is coming out of that program. That's my hope. I, I mean, again, I, we have to start early if we're really going to influence change. I, it's great to educate high school students, and I still believe in doing that, by the way. But if we really want to influence who, if I want to influence the audience who says, I want to do that, and I believe I can because I see somebody like me who's doing that, then we have to start at earlier ages. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, and and it and it also builds in that time to help um, educate entire families about what the profession is about because I think that um, oftentimes uh, we just assume that students are making all of these decisions independently, and we know well we know in our own homes that's often not the case. <laughs> but but there's also some really great career choice research that talks about um, how. Um, students of color make decisions regarding career choice very differently than their white counterparts. And in fact, a, that m the majority of that difference is due to um, family influence. Um, and so um, the, the family plays a much larger looming role <laughs> in yeah. um, the choices that that students um, gravitate to. So um, so that's definitely something that, that we all have to think about as we expose kids to STEM careers and careers in veterinary medicine that, that we need to also be sure that we're um, thinking about how do we recruit the whole family. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, what do you see coming down the pike in the, in, you know, this for this next year, 2018-19? Um, I think most of what I have listed that it's it's a lot of uh, module development, education, outreach, shaking hands, getting uh, boots on the ground uh, and really working with people and asking a lot of questions. And, and really, as a whole organization, that's what we're doing. Um, I'm, I'm just one very small piece of that puzzle. Um, so that's our investment now and over the coming years to really how can we help our membership thrive? And as part of that, how do we um, play an integral role in our community and helping the profession as a whole thrive? Great. Thanks. Well, Jen, I'm delighted to work with you. Um, these last, these last, however months it's been, these almost year has just been marvelous. Um, we're having a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. So uh, everyone be sure to kind of watch what we do. <laughs> I think we've got some cool, some cool uh, things that that we'll be doing collaboratively uh, in the next year and and down the line as well. Great, thank you. Thank you.
So with that, we will wrap another episode of AAVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air. You can find episodes of the show on YouTube. You can watch our video versions there. You can also uh, catch the audio-only versions on SoundCloud, SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, any of those podcast apps that folks are using to get their content. You can also find information about the show as well as other things that are going on related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession on the podcast's Facebook page, which is AAVMC Diversity and inclusion on air. So with that, we will wrap another episode. We'll see you next time. We have one more amazing show for season three, and that will focus on diversity and wellness, specifically looking at um, wellness indicators for um, diverse, marginalized, historically underrepresented populations in the profession. So I'm really excited about that last show of the season. Um, and with that, we will wrap this episode. Thank you again, Dr. Brandt, for coming on and chatting a bit about what's going on at the AVMA. And we will see you next time. Thank you.